Number 12 and 13 are about uh, demonstrating mastery over negative exponents. So understanding what negative exponents mean and understanding how to reduce and simplify and that sort of thing. So uh, in number 12, uh, I know 4 and 8 seem to be able to divide into each other, but I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this because that ne 4 to the negative 2 simply means that there's a 4 squared in the denominator. And I have an 8 cubed up in the numerator. Now, you're more than welcome to multiply this out, but just really think about what that means. That means 8 times 8 times 8 and 4 times 4 for the denominator. And I happen to know that 4 goes into 8 twice and 4 goes into 8 twice. So I can a little bit quicker see that it's 2 times 2 times 8. So that's 32. Uh, in number 13, and we have that rule that says if you have an exponent raised to an exponent, then you would multiply those numbers together. So a to the negative 2 would be times negative 3. And b to the negative 5 would be times negative 3 as well. And then I would just go ahead and multiply the exponents together. So that would be a to the 6 times b to the 15th. And there's our answer there. Uh, number 14, I think it's very vital that we continue to play with order of ops and make sure that we understand um, how to simplify an expression. So the first thing that I want to do is double check that, that I might not even need parentheses. Uh, so if I look at this uh, in order of ops, then I would read it from left to right and look for whatever multiply or divide happens first and then do it in that, in that order. So if I set it up the way I see it, I get 16 divided by 4, which is 4 times 2 plus 8. And so that would be 2 plus 8 plus 8, uh, which is 18. And that's not 12. OK, so the way it is, I, need to, I do need to put parentheses in there somewhere. So I just need to look and see, um, just kind of play around for a second. So let's say I play around and put it up here at the front. Well, 2 plus 16 is 18. 18 divided by 4 is not a whole number. It's like, you know, it's like a decimal at some point, and I, there's no way that I would be able to get rid of a decimal if I brought one into it. So that's not going to make sense. Um, if I put around the 6 divided by 4, that's actually what order of ops would say to do first anyways. So that doesn't make sense. So let's try 4 times 2 first. What if I make us do that first? Okay, so let's kind of see if that is going to cause any problems, in which case we're going to have to keep going here. Uh, see, that, that order ops would be the multiply first, so 2 plus 16 divided by 8 plus 8. Uh, then I do the divide, so that's 2 plus 2 plus 8. And, oh, there we go, that's it. Uh, 2 plus 10, so 12 equals 12. Okay, so my parentheses go uh, around the 4 times the 2. I find number 15 to be a rather interesting question for students. Um, let, me, let me clarify what, what I mean by this. Uh, the directions say classify each as true or false. If false, show an example of why it's false. Okay, so what I see a lot of from students is they like to find an example of where it's true, and then they'll tell me it's true. And they're missing the point. The point is not to prove to me that it's true. The point is to prove to me that it's false. Okay. Um, if you notice, it says classify it's true or false, and then give a counterexample if it's false. It doesn't say give an example if it's true. So if you're hunting for a situation where there's evidence that it's true, Therefore, it has to, you're kind of going about this wrong. You want to come up with a situation where it's not true or it's false, right? You want to think of some examples. So one way to mess with this or one way to do this is just make up some numbers. Uh, try it with positive numbers and see if it works there. Then go to negative numbers and see if you look at negative numbers. Does that rule still apply? Um, just put physical numbers in it and see if you can uh, 
come up with a false scenario, and it should be really hard for you to write true. That should be like the last resort. Like you've tried a couple things, and there's just no way to get that to happen. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say, all right, let's let's just try x equals uh, two. Again, I'm just guessing here. So the absolute value of two squared equals two squared. Well, let's kind of think out loud for a second. Um, absolute value will always give me a positive number. So if I plug in a positive number and I get out a positive, so positive two is kind of not a good one to start with. Um, but we'll go through it anyway, so we'll just look at it. So two squared is four, and is the absolute value of four equal to four? Yeah, that works. Okay, so it works for positive. Now again, I didn't. I'm not looking for true. I'm looking for a counterexample. So let's try negative two and see if it still works out that way. So negative two squared equals negative two squared. And again, I added parentheses to this because I want to remind myself the negative is also squared. So whatever number I plug into that blank that I'm squaring. Well, the absolute value, well, see, so negative 2 squared here is 4. So I'm looking at the absolute value of 4, and negative 2 squared is also equal to 4. Okay, so I tried a positive, I tried a negative, and both cases it worked for me. So it seems, um, at least on the surface right now, that this statement is true. Um, but I did try a couple things. Okay. Uh, second one, B. So if a over a over b equals a n equal a b, okay. So let's again we the a's and the b's are constant, but m and n don't have a value with it. So I'm just going to pick two numbers, um, and since I get to decide what the two numbers are, I'm going to start by picking something that's different, and see if that actually uh, still gives me a true statement. So I end up with a over b, okay, and this is uh, one a times n, one, which is a, and this is b times two, which is two b. Well, is a over b equal to a over two b? That's actually not true. Those aren't the same. Uh, well, great. Okay, so then then this would be false, and I have my counterexample, and the counterexample is when n equals one and m equals two. So I found one set of numbers where it's false, so therefore it's it's a false statement. Now, it's possible to come up with true. If I happen to pick n and m's that were equal, then I would get a true statement, right? But again, that's not the goal. The goal is to show that it is false. Uh, all right. Uh, C should look familiar. It's actually one of our properties of fractions. That actually is a fraction rule. Um, so that one's actually true. And I'm not going to waste time trying to look at examples or counterexamples because that's one of our rules. So I'll just put a rule in there. Uh, part D. Uh, so we've got mixed numbers, and it looks like uh, I manip I moved around some of the numerators to see if it's actually a true statement or not. So then I got to think about my fraction rules. And I'm thinking probably the easiest way to go about this is to convert these mixed numbers into improper fractions. So 2 times 5 uh, plus 2, so that's 12 over 5 times 3 times 5, so 15 plus so 19 over 5. And I'm not sure if that's equal or not, so I'm going to put a little question mark there. Uh, 2, so 14 over 5 and... This would be 17 over 5. Well, I can see they're all over 5. The question is, is 12 times 19 the same as 14 times 17? Now, we might not know that off the top of our heads, but I can always just jump to a calculator. Let's see, 12 times 19 is 228. A little question mark here. And 14 times 17 is 238. Okay, so that those clearly do not match, right? So this happens to be false, that I cannot manipulate 
the numerators like I did and still expect it to be an equivalent fraction. Number 16, we're just solving the equation. Uh, this is an example of cross multiply and divide. So we have x equals 7 times 90 over 15. So if I multiply that uh, across, I should get uh, 42 when all said and done. Uh, number 17, we are practicing, uh, this time we're looking at fractions and uh, exponent rules. Uh, let's see, so write the following in simplest form. Okay, so one, one half to the sixth. So that's one half, it's one to the sixth and, I don't know where that sixth came from, uh, two to the sixth. And we have that rule that says if we divide, we're going to multiply by the reciprocal. So 2 squared over 1 squared. All right. Uh, now, obviously, the 1s aren't going to matter. So 1 to the 6th is just 1. And 2 squared, you know, sorry, 1 squared is just 1. So up, I really end up with 2 times 2. And then 2, so you got 6 of these things. Let's make sure i got enough here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so we're good. And I notice that two of them divide out. So I should be left with one over uh, two to the fourth. And two to the fourth is a uh, 16. So that expression simplifies down to one over 16. Uh, number 18, we are finding two fractions between these two given fractions. Uh, so the best way to go about doing that would be to convert them into common denominators and see uh, what the numerators look like. Uh, so between fifteenths and thirds, uh, I can see thirtieths uh, being the easiest one. Well, no, I will just actually keep it in terms of fifteenths. So seven fifteenths is fine. Uh, Two thirds, I need to. I can need to make that into fifteen. So I'm going to multiply by five there. So I'll multiply by 5 there, so 2 times 5 is 10. Okay, so if you kind of think about it on a number line, I've got 7 fifteenths there, I've got 10 fifteenths there. Well, there's got to be room for 8 fifteenths and 9 fifteenths. So those are the two fractions that I'm looking for. Those are two fractions between uh, 7 fifteenths and 10 fifteenths. Now that was in terms of fifteenths. I could have brought it to a, another denominator if I wanted to. Um, but the skill that I'm looking for is that you can convert it to some sort of common denominator and then identify the you know necessary numerators that make them different. All right, number 19. Uh, let me read it first, and then we'll talk about what I'm asking you to do here. Uh, an eighth grade student uh, claims she can prove subtraction of integers is cumulative. Uh, uh, commutative, sorry. Wow. Uh, she points out that if a and b are integers, then a minus b equals a plus negative b. Since addition is com uh, commutative, so is subtraction. What is your response? Uh, so she claims that you can, since you can switch the order when you add any two numbers, technically you can rewrite any uh, addition, uh, subtraction as addition, so you should be able to do the same thing, right? Okay, so what I'm looking for in this sense is that you, uh, one, you understand what, what on earth the student is saying and that you actually can come up with a reasonable explanation as to whether or not the student is correct or not. So we have to decide for ourselves if there's even truth to what she's saying. Well, she opened it up and she said that if A and B are integers. Okay, so what are integers then? Integers could be all positive whole numbers could be uh, negative whole numbers. So positive 2 is an integer, uh, negative 4 is an integer. So this is a very fancy way of saying, is there a counterexample? Because there's always some time when it could work, but is it always going to work? And can I find one situation that makes it false? So this is another fancy way, it's a very fancy application problem on, is there a counterexample to this statement? Uh, so I'm going to pick two numbers, and let's try 2 and 3. I'll try that and see if that disproves her. So uh, if I go 2 minus 3, I get negative 1. 
So she's saying that it should be able to reverse the order. And so 3 minus 2 is positive 1. Well, what do you think? Did I just find a counterexample? The student claimed that you should be able to switch the order. That's what community property says to do. I just picked two numbers. The first two numbers I picked it didn't even work. All right? And so while she is correct it's true for addition, it's actually not true for subtraction. So what is my response? Um, I would say uh, not true for subtraction for all numbers. You know, because most teenagers will come up with a, an example where it works, and they're like, well, it works in this case. I'm like, yeah, sometimes just numbers are weird. Sometimes a specific pair of numbers will demonstrate that property. But the, when we say that there is a property, a rule for this, we're saying it works for all numbers. And since I happen to find uh, a counterexample, so not true for all numbers, comma, for example, a equals 2 and b equals 3. It does not work for that. So again, what I'm looking for for number 19 for something like this type of question is I'm looking for one that you get it right, that you actually understand what the student's saying, and that you're able to justify the correct answer, either you agree or disagree, uh, and then you give justification for uh, one way or the other. So in other words, fancy way of saying um, counterexample.